Richardson takes it off. A goal from the heavens for Kieran Richardson. Rene could be in here. He's all alone. He's gone. Sensation at Wembley from Sunderland. McKinney. Hello and welcome back to the What The Folk Sunland Preview Show. The Call of Winchester show as well continues to roll on as another superb Sunland performance sees us take a two-point lead at the top of the table. However, coming this Saturday is an away trip to a side we've actually failed to beat at Highbury since we fell into League One. And Joey Barton may well be gone, but the familiar face of Simon Grayson is in charge now. He'll be looking to show Sunland fans that he's much more than just a flip chart. To preview Saturday's clash with us is digital sports journalist for the Lancashire Post, Tom Sandals, who will be giving us the lowdown on Fleetwood season so far. Tom, how are you doing? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, looking forward to uh, look forward to the chat and seeing what's what. I feel like this has been about a year in the making because we've planned on doing it a few times and then just our timelines haven't really collided. So I'm pleased to have you on, mate. Uh, that's yeah, yeah, good. it's good. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember what it was last time, but it was like, we planned like a couple of days and then each of us had something going on. It was just one of those, weren't it? Yeah, it does happen. Busy, yeah. busy men, so we pretend. <laughs> um, we'll start from the top. Obviously, a, a terrific result in the context of, of Fleetwood season. Um, or the Cod Army, if you prefer, on Saturday, defeating Rotherham at the New York Stadium. Obviously, results, that's probably been the most impressive result in terms of the game so far. But how important was that result and the performance, most importantly, to the context of Fleetwood season? Well, probably not as important as most would think from the outside. Simon Grayson has been pretty happy with the performances so far. He's generally said in most press conferences that he feels that in in most games this season, they probably could have won. It's not a case that they've gone out and got battered at any point, really. So I think it's one of those where earlier on the season, games that could go either way weren't going Fleetwood's way. So they had a really poor start to the season. Uh, But once they kind of got going a little bit, and it's kind of the way... he had a little bit of a slow start when he first came in Simon Grace and then kind of got a bit of stability and, and kind of built that platform and made like kind of got into a rhythm of being hard to beat. So they're sort of getting back to that now. Um, and again, last season is a little feature that, that Fleetwood would turn a few sides over towards the top. I remember when Doncaster were flying, they, I think they came to Highbury and, and got beat three nil. So it, it's one of those where they knew going into it that, that Rotherham would be a good side, but, obviously back themselves to, 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 to beat them. When you speak to them, you say kind of, how will you approach the game? And it'll, it'll always say, you know, we're aware of what they do, but we'll focus on ourselves and what we're capable of. And I think that's probably what got them the result against Rotherham. I think it wasn't obviously that long ago, and obviously it's a long old season, but um, Fleetwood were, were player hopefuls and they were mm. sort of pushing the top half of the table. However, and this is very much outside looking in, Since Joey Barton's departed, it seems that fortunes, I suppose, have changed, or the outlooks maybe changed, but it can't be as simple as as Joey Barton leaving, which we'll come on to. Um, But just from a Fleetwood perspective, could you run us through why maybe the outlook has changed from maybe opposition fans or or maybe why it looks like you're you're not playoff or promotion hopefuls like you once were not that long ago? A lot of a lot of personnel has changed for a start. Um, that that playoff side that Joey Barton, that, well, the side that Joey Barton got into the playoffs. I, I don't really want to say Joey Bart, the, Barton got them into the playoffs because they were a good side and they had a good a good setup. But in there, there's there's I think four of the five lone players were key players. So I want to that, for example, Harry Suter, who's now regarded as one of Stoke's best defenders. He spent one and a half seasons at, at Fleetwood and did really well. There's Liam Gibson, who last season was at Reading. He was really good. Uh, Barry Mackay was playing brilliantly at Fleetwood and then uh, didn't really replicate it the season after. So they got the... the it's kind of the curse of, of League One, really, um, or probably the Football League. It can happen that loan players come in, they're very influential, and you're just not able to replace them, not able to keep them permanently. Um, so that was an issue. And I think... 
partly it was just the Joey Barton effect, really. He, mm-hmm. he, he is one of those characters that he can ruffle feathers. And after a period of time, it does tire. And, it, you know, I think Fleetwood would like a week without being in the, in the papers, would like a week of quiet. But it's not entirely possible with Joey. Um, so I think once things started to get a bit more difficult um, and obviously he was constantly ruffling feathers, there was a bit where he'd, he'd refused to play Chet Evans again, who was a favourite of the fans, favourite of the owner. Uh, obviously a good player at this level, ended up going to Preston. Um, little bits like that that just sort of started to stack up. Results weren't great either when he left, so it wasn't like... It wasn't like um, Joey Barton left. He was sacked by the man, by the owner, so it was one of those. It, it sort of run its course, but the the turnover of players has been quite drastic, and they're cutting the cloth a little differently as well. People like Paddy Madden, who were on a decent wage, Josh Morris, who left in the summer, um, you know they were they were phased out. And you, if you look at the Fleetwood squad, it's it's much younger, um, much less experienced, bar a couple of players brought in Tom Clark, Anthony Pilkington and Joe Garner just recently to add that little bit more experience. But there is a, a much, much bigger focus on bringing players through the academy, which wasn't happening too much with Joey Barton. And I think there is that with, with Joey Barton as well. And I know we're going back almost a year since he was sacked, but I remember the first ever press conference I ever attended. It was something in Fleetwood and Phil Parkinson was our manager. And if I'm honest with you, as much as our relationship as a Sunderland fan, as opposed to a journalist, is not... Great with Joey Barton, let's be honest. Mm. Um, you were kind of waiting for his blockbuster comments about what was he going to say about something that was going to be, it wasn't going to be Phil Parkinson's quote. And I guess it, after a while, it does get tiresome because um, you start seeing through stuff. And obviously, we've seen clips of the documentary and all that kind of thing. But we're talking of Barton before we do move away from him completely. Obviously, he's really struggled at Bristol Rovers, who mm. got relegated. And if, you could say, well, maybe you took over a side that wasn't his, but it's not really improved that much in League Two. But there was a time when Fleetwood fans, I wouldn't say worshipped him, but you had that siege mentality and you could feel it from the outside looking in. But it seems like he's muddied waters a little bit. Obviously, the results weren't great. You've explained a little bit about what went on there. But but why is the perception of Joey Barton change within Fleetwood fans? Why does he seem to be um, not, not, I wouldn't say disliked, but he doesn't seem to have been as heralded as maybe he was back in the day? Yeah, I think I think he was just picking fights maybe with the wrong people. He, he he bombed out Alex Cairns, who's I think close to it, if not the leading appearance maker in the FL for Fleetwood. Um, he's been there a long time. The fans love him. He's a really nice guy. Um, Chad Evans again, another one that the fans loved, and just little bits like that. That and it, in those scenarios, because he did he did get rid of influential players at the start of his, his time at, at Fleetwood, like Bobby Grant, for example. And um when it when he when you do it and you get the results, that's okay. But he was doing it and not getting the results. So fans were losing their favorite players. Joey Barton was ruffling feathers and wasn't getting the results for it. So at that point you go, Well, why is he? why are we losing some of our favourite players and still having to watch our team struggle when those players are available and could maybe do a better job? So I think as well, football's fickle, isn't it? And as soon as, as soon as a manager stops winning, you know, they're almost public enemy number one. So I think Fleetwood fans will always be grateful to him. And I do think he looked really bright when he first came in and he, he he says the right things. I mean, let's be fair, from a point of view of having to fill the paper, I was never struggling. I always had a decent line, always had another, a, a different quote, or you get back to the office like, Joey said this, I think we better leave that one out this week, um, and things like that. And that's just the nature of the beast with him. He was, he was good value, but it's a results business at the end of the day. And that's why someone like Simon Grayson came in, came in who's not Hollywood by any stretch of the imagination, but was a breath of fresh air nonetheless because Fleetwood knew what they could expect from him. They were getting a, a professional, dependable type, and it just calmed the whole calmed the whole place down. It was exactly what they needed and what they wanted. Touched on um, Alex Keynes. They obviously got back on the side as well. Um, fell out of favour with Joey Barton, but potentially, I wouldn't say man of the match, but one of the players of the game on Saturday, he's, he's kind of really came back and shown why he should have never really been dropped as well, hasn't he? Yeah, he's that kind of type, to be fair. He's 
very professional knows and when, when you speak to him about drop i mean he didn't just get dropped he lost his number one shirt which you know it's not it's not that it was available and he gave it to joel coleman who was coming in he took it away from alex ken so it was like an, a double whammy sort of thing and he, he stuck it out obviously i think generally can be the case with players you, you're probably going to be there longer than a manager especially these days i think the average length of a manager managers reigns for something like 18 months or something and players longer generally have contracts longer than that anyway um but you speak to him about it and he said yeah it was a tough time but you just gotta stick with it and he doesn't shy away from those sorts of things you can always talk to him about it and I'm really happy to see him doing so well because it's kind of what what he's been doing I think his confidence took a hit I don't think Joey Barton helped in that regard that um you know I he dropped a few in, in the playoffs. There's, there's no hiding that. It's one of those things. But I think people forget as well, Harry Suter, who I mentioned before, who's now, you know, the talk of Stoke City. He, in their second leg against Wickham, kept the ball in inside the six-yard box for no apparent reason, straight to the Wickham forward who set up a goal. So it's it's one of those. He wasn't the only person to to have a clangor in the playoffs, but as a goalkeeper, it, um it stands out. I think Fleetwood just went into it expecting to win, to be honest. And I think that's what cost him. I think potentially it was a little bit of a scapegoat, but he's a really steady goalkeeper. Great, great reflexes, great uh, shot stopper. So, yeah, he's, he's done really well, deserves his place because as soon as Simon Grayson came in, he had no qualms about putting him in and he's, he's been in ever since. I think the owner was quite keen to see him continue as well. But, I mean, the owner doesn't pick the team. That's not to say that he does. <laughs> Funny you mentioned about uh, players outstaying a, a manager. I think Aidan McGeady's ears might be burning as we we're discussing that. But um, obviously, that, as you've mentioned before, there is a new manager, someone who knows really well. He's not well remembered on Rear side. Most <laughs> of that lot are not, let's be honest. Um, I know a few fans were like not too sure because originally he was at Blackpool and so on and so forth when he first went in. However, he's I think he's approaching his first year if he's not approached it already. So in short, he's had challenges with changing personnel. But how is his, his first year... Uh, how, how have the fans taken him in the first year? Most importantly, and how's it gone? I think it's gone all right. Yeah, the fans, the fans are happy with him. Um, as I say, I think the, the expectations have changed a little. They're cutting the cloth a little differently. So I think the expectation is generally, you know, or short term, it's maybe just a spite. Make sure they're in League One, and you can kind of build from there. The focus is going more towards the academy, which. Simon Grayson, generally speaking, throughout his career, has got a decent track record of trusting young players or wanting young players to come in. So that's very big. The, the academy at, at Fleetwood is brilliant, to be fair. There's the setup at, at, at the training ground is better than a lot of championship sides. It's really good. And that's credit to Andy, Andy Pilly, the owner. Um, as I mentioned before, he just kind of he's just a very calming influence. You know, he knows what he's doing. And even people inside the club, just the people he's working with, he has such a big influence on them. I mean, again, I'm just speaking from a press point of view, but Joey Barton, say a press conference is supposed to be quarter past nine. He could turn up at half past nine and, and then chat for 10 minutes. Then we'd start a 40, 50 minute press conference when there's only me and the radio there. There's only two outlets and it, you know it can go on forever. Whereas Simon's always there, straight on the time. You do the press conference, you, you're never struggling for, for quotes, he'll talk to you properly and then it's done and it's so much more, more professional. The people inside the club are, are grateful for that. Um, he came in and it, it was a little difficult at first, but once they got kind of got into a rhythm of things, they had one of the best defensive records in the league. So he's definitely capable. His time at Fleetwood didn't, uh, time at Blackpool didn't go particularly well. Uh, second time, which he's admitted to. And I think that's one of those things that it happens with managers. Obviously happened at Sunderland as well, but before that, you know, he did very well at, at Preston. So, and did well at Blackpool, Huddersfield, Leeds before that. So he's, he's got it, he's got it in him. Uh, he's pretty good at working with smaller budgets, which is what he's got at the moment. Um, seems to be getting a tune out of the, the younger players as well. So it, it's gone pretty well. Um, obviously still room to grow. I suppose every club's aim is, is the playoffs, but with the state of League One this season, it's very difficult for 12 teams to make the playoffs. So I think they're happy enough staying in the division, given the amount of outgoings that he's had to deal with as well. He's, he's moved a lot of players on and he does see this as his squad. He said that, so he can be judged on this season. Um, but given the size of Fleetwood and the size of some of the other teams in, in League One, I think they are happy enough around mid-table, even lower half, just to stay in the league and, Generally, Simon's done a, a pretty good job of just steadying the shit, which was kind of the remit. 
It's funny in the sense that there'll be a lot of Sunderland fans, obviously, with their ears perking up when you hear any positives about Simon Grayson, but it's such a different beast. Like, without overestimating Sunderland, without belittling Fleetwood, it's two very different clubs that he took over at very, very different times in very, very different circumstances. So I think at this level, Grayson's obviously been there, done it, and he's experience is massive when you want to just, as you said, steady your ship. But obviously there was there was talk of a Fleetwood documentary. We've all seen the trailers uh, not too long ago. Has the fact that it's not been released due in part to Simon Grayson's PTSD from Sunday until I die? I don't think so. It doesn't feature on it, actually. It's it's only a, a Joey Barton one. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, only a Joey Barton one. So I think he's think he's escaped that one for now. And I don't think there's any talk of another one, so he can he can relax a little bit. Not yeah. the Fleetwood one anyway. Yeah, it was all it was all Joey Barton based. So uh, yeah, there's been a bit of complications at that end. So it's all been delayed a little bit. I think Simon will be happy not to have any more documentaries about football clubs with involving him ever again. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think to be fair, and, and I did it myself um, on a different podcast that I do, I think many tip Fleetwood for relegation uh, based on back in the last term, probably based on my experiences of Simon Grayson as the manager and kind of, I wouldn't say the plummet, but the fact that it went from, as we said before, player footballs to kind of suddenly just not. Um, but you come into the game on the back of two wins and three, and the draw that you got in between was uh, against Plymouth, who were playing really well, obviously stuffed Sheffield Wednesday on um, on Saturday, and obviously a win in the, the pizza trophy or the whatever it's mm. called these days. Um, the Mouse Cup. That's the one, yeah. Although we are the we are the favourites, well, not the favourites, yeah. the whole day, should I say, but yeah, pizza cup is the pizza cup. Um a fleet would perhaps shown that, you know, or shown League One or people outside of the club that have maybe been underestimated over the past few weeks. Yeah, I did. I must admit, I did a, a thing with like League One writers and you kind of predict who, who you think will go up, who you think will go down. And a lot of those thought Fleetwood would go down. So you're not on your own in predicting that. Um, I think the recruitment this season has been very different. I think in the past, you could rely on Fleetwood to kind of get a, a sort of a big sign in from above, get a, a sort of championship maybe, well, probably championship really, not even top end of League One, probably championship player who's 29, 30, wouldn't mind another two-year contract on a decent wage and they'd come in and probably get at least a good 12 to 18 months out of them before maybe their legs start going or they start to fade a little bit. And that's not the case this season. That The players they've brought in have been a lot younger. Um, I think that will hinder them and it did make me a little bit more pessimistic towards it that, you know, I don't think ambitious is probably not the wrong, the right word, but they've not probably been quite as ambitious as they normally have in terms of signing. They are under a, an embargo for uh, borrowing money during the coronavirus from the FL, so they can only pay up to two and a half thousand pounds a week and can't pay transfer fees. But the word from the club is that that's what they were planning to do anyway. They were they were bringing down the wage because obviously they had the. Um, the salary cap in initially which wouldn't really have affected Fleetwood and obviously it's gone now but they kind of still want to work sort of towards that model um, I mean there is still potential in these players that have come in um, depending if they hit the ground there's, there's some really good young talent at Fleetwood as well I mean I always talk about James Hill who's just been called up for England in the 20s who's the only player from a, um, a level 3 academy to make it so you've got all the top clubs in there and then a player from Fleetwood who's who is brilliant for the for the record with a massive throw in as well one to keep an eye out for uh, I like really like Jamie Tetty in midfield he had bids from Stoke in the summer and Jed Garner is a looks a really classy player up front who used to be um, in the Liverpool Academy so they've, they've got talent there whether it all comes good this season or not I'm not sure but given the way Simon Grayson came into the club last season, I'd be surprised if they went down or were even too close to going down come the end of the season. I think they'll be fairly comfortable in League One. They won't be challenging the top six, I don't expect, but I, I doubt they'll be looking over the shoulder too much. There'll be times like any season for any mid-table-ish club, there'll be probably a time where, oh, we're only six points off the playoffs and then that quickly becomes more, oh, we're only six points off the relegation and that quickly becomes more. So there'll be moments. But when push comes to shove, I, I can't see it being too much of an issue. Talking about players to, to look out for, um, the one that stood out for me is the one you've just mentioned there, was, which was Hill. He's mm -hmm. been linked with a move further up the pyramid. Mm -hmm. I can't for the life of me recall which club it was, but obviously I think he was linked to a high-end championship. I think it was maybe even someone like Everton maybe looking at him, but um, 19 years old, plays in part of a back three, so it looks like. Ju just how good is he? Very good. 
Uh, he's still a little rough around the edges, as you'd expect for any 19-year-old. He first came into the team at, at 16 against Blackpool of all teams for this massive derby on the Fylde Coast and kind of been in and out under Barton. Uh, when Simon Grayson came in, he was still with the under-23s and one of the first things he did was bring him into the fold. Played him for most of last season and it's only done. It's only benefited him. Uh, I mean, to be honest, recently, since he got the under-20s call-up, he's not actually been in the team. They've, uh, they switched to a back four recently. And they went with the the other two who were, he got picked up an injury. So the other two that were in the back three, Tom Clark and uh, Harrison Holgate, have been the two that have been starting. Um, but yeah, he's he's very good. He's been, I mean, he's probably only been linked with one or two clubs. But I know that the majority of Premier League clubs have been down, sent scouts to to keep an eye on him and and watch over him. His his contract runs out in twelve months in the summer. Um, it's one of those situations where Fleet would know. Um, if he does go on a free, they'll get a decent chunk of, of compensation for him coming through the academy. So they're fairly comfortable with that to a point. Um, I don't think there's any plans to sell him, for example. But he is a very good player. He's, he's fairly quick, um, knows how to time a tackle, knows when to cover. And he's still learning. You know, he's got, he, he could go a very long way. And I mentioned before, that throwing is a huge asset. He, he can throw it so, so far. It's like Rory the lap sort of thing. It, it's, it's so far. It's not just like one of those where oh, they'll kind of reach the edge of the box, they'll kind of reach a six-yard box. He will reach the far post if you need to. Like So that in itself adds more value to him. But, I mean, with the way his contract is, I'd be surprised if he's at Fleetwood next season, for example. But he's only going up for me at the moment. Funny you mentioned the uh, the long throw there, and you mentioned Rory Dillard. I think I'm showing my age by thinking when you think of uh, long throws, I go straight to Dave Challoner. From yeah. here, obviously, yeah. which is who used to be on the on the file coast himself. I used to speak to him as uh, as file manager before he left there, and uh, he's done very well at Hartlepool. In the yes, area. yeah, he has done very well. Nice to see as well. It might be a controversial thing to say on this podcast, but I'm quite quite pleased <laughs> to see him doing well. Um, I'm kind of I don't know whether it's a privileged position, but it is in terms of this podcast. But I've seen I think it was Fleetwood under 18s We're talking a year and a half ago. Um, well, before the the COVID pandemic and. Very impressive seeing them against Rangers in a preseason friendly. Um, I won't bore anyone with the story of why, but I just did. Um, essentially, I think the academy is something that Fleetwood that's probably going under the radar and, and certainly is above this level. You've brought in a lot of experienced players this year. Obviously, you've brought in um, Joe Garner, Pilkington's come in. Um, Morton's came in. I know he's still quite young, but obviously had time at, at um, Lincoln last year as well. Tom Clark's obviously come in, vastly experienced. But recently, there's been a lot of the squad made up from... I think there was a kid as young as 16 not too long ago in the, in the squad. Mm-hmm. How important is that academy going to be for, for Fleetwood moving forward if they're changing the model of, of who, who they're bringing in? Yeah, it's going to be very important. It's not something that they're unaware of because they are trying to even get to a level two academy. So they've got plans for a million pound indoor dome to be built. So they've got an indoor pitch. So to spend for a League One club to be spending a million pounds on infrastructure when it's already got a very, very good infrastructure there, you know, it's unheard of, really, especially even still in COVID. Um, they've got international players, a, a small international academy there as well. They've got, you know, all through the levels. It's it's something that the owner is very keen on. And you mentioned that 16-year-old who was on the bench recently. That's Josh Feeney, who's now at Aston Villa, who paid about half a million pounds for a 16-year-old. He's six foot four, England under 16 captain, you know, and he's come through at Fleetwood. And that's kind of almost a selling point as well is they go they're able to now go to clubs and look look this is what we've been able to do this is what we're able to produce James Hill England under 20 international um and I think in the uh pizza cup not long ago they had uh, seven of the 11 who had come through the Fleetwood Academy so there's opportunities there there is a pathway there um so it's, it's going to be very important but I don't think it's forced either I think they've got the potential there as long as they're given the opportunity they weren't quite given the same opportunity under under Joey Barton, but, you know, under Simon Grayson, I think, for example, um, Harrison Holgate, currently playing at centre-half, come through the academy, a really good League One player. Shaden Morris, who scored a couple of times this season already, he's played at right wing back and right wing, quick, direct, another from the academy. Uh, Jed Garner's come through the academy at the later stages. Um, you know, um, Harvey Saunders last year, who, who scored three against uh, three in the, I think he scored seven in his first three games or something silly, all in the Papa John's Trophy. Um, but he'd come through the academy as well. So 
you know, I mentioned before Jamie Tetty, James Hill. Um, th- there is quality there. There's Ryan Rydell, who often played on left wing back, who's who's looked very good. Paddy Lane, there's, there's I mean, three players that have been with the um, Islands under 21s recently. So they've got good quality coming through. It's just about giving them the chance. And I think with Simon Grayson, he will give them a chance. So it's one of those where it's going to be really important but I think they'll create their own worth anyway. I think they'll be there where you can't quite ignore it, especially when you get to a level two academy and you get more time, more staff to, to focus on it. I think it's you know only a matter of time and they bring in cash when they're sold, which always helps. I don't like to speak um, ill of the dead, but I've just kind of reminded myself that James Hill could potentially be referred to as Jimmy Hill, which will make him very unpopular with the Sunderland fans at the weekend. Um, hopefully he refers to as James because he might be in for a bit of stick, if not. Um, <laughs> one player who absolutely boomed last year at the start, like ridiculous form and then just kind of fell off a cliff, was was Callum Camps. But he was back in the goals on Saturday. Um, I'm basing it on one game, but could we be seeing a return to last season's early form for Callum Camps? I mean, possibly. I mean, he's shown last year that he's got it in him. Even at the time, he was saying, you know, it's, it's one of those where I'm I'm scoring like everything I'm hitting at the moment is going in. I know it won't last. And, you know, over the course of a season, it's probably... He, he went a, a big period of time without scoring, but he'd already scored, say, seven or eight goals that season. Had he not scored eight in the first, I don't know, two months of the season, something silly, and instead kind of chipped away all the way through the season, you'd never criticise his goal scoring and you say, oh, he's a, he's a steady goal scoring midfielder. Um, so he did have sort of a, a very purple patch, then a bit of a, a dry spell, struggled a little bit with injury at times, but he's he is a very good player. He's got it in him. He knows when to arrive in the box. He's got that sort of natural goal scoring ability. Um, I mean, I'd love to see him get back to where he was last season because everything he was hitting was going in. They weren't tappings. I think... Took about six, seven goals before he actually scored a tap in. I was amazed. They, they were all screamers before that. He's got, I think, a 40 yard knuckleball free kick against Bristol Rovers. It was insane. So it, it, the technical quality is there. He's got that license to get forward in uh, Grayson's system, especially if there's only one up front. He wants him to get up there, he wants him to support. So, it, I mean, I was muting the fact that he could have been called up for Northern Ireland last season when, when he was playing so well. He wasn't a million miles away. Um, he had spoken to the to Northern Ireland manager. So he has it in him. Whether it's here to stay at this moment in time, it remains to be seen. He's, he's chipped in with a couple recently. Um, but it, it, if he can get that back there, you know, it's going to be a big part for Fleetwood because I think the biggest struggle this year will likely be goals. Uh, so if they can chip in from elsewhere, I mean, left-back's scoring a few free kicks already this season, Danny Andrews. So where they can get goals from elsewhere, I think it'll it'll help massively. I think that's another player as well. I was going to ask who else we should be wary of, but Danny Andrews obviously got great set-piece delivery. He's known for his, his free kick, but obviously he's not too bad from corners, set-pieces. Um, and he's started the season really well as well, hasn't he? Yeah, I was speaking to him not long ago and I was saying, because he, he scored free kicks quite regularly for a while, But how often he takes them is another thing. So I was kind of asking him about that. And he said, well, they had Josh Morris, who was a left footer as well, who generally wanted free kicks. So he kind of let him take it. He's not the type to kind of muscle his way in. But he said this season he's kind of hoping to put his stamp on it. And (laughs) when he scores at the kind of, he's got the success rate he does from free kicks. It's crazy that he's not been on them more regularly before now. Um, He can play kind of centre half, left centre half in the back three as well, which gives him a little bit extra Going forward, you've got that sort of a more attacking angle from there. I I really like Jed Garner up front as well. When when he's on on song, he's a very very nice player to watch. He's got a really nice touch. He just sorts of sort of glides around the pitch a little bit, can check inside bits like that. And if he's going, you know, he'll be really enjoyable to watch. There's still obviously the likes of Jordan Roster in centre midfield. Who's if you if you're the opposite type, I like to see someone going put the foot in, go and do the dirty work. He's good to watch, puts everything out there, captain this season. Um, and then, yeah, the young players littered around as well as something to keep your eye out for. My favourite part of the podcast, I'll openly admit, is when I ask opposition fans about how great Sunderland are. Um, <laughs> I think, to be fair, looking from the, the outside looking in, you could probably tell from the intro, 
Sunderland's a good place to be at the moment. We've actually done something we've we've hoped that we would do for a while and started incredibly well. But from the outside looking in, what have you made of Sunderland's start? It's, with the size of Sunderland, it's hard not to sort of say, well, it's kind of to be expected. Because, But I think at times as well, maybe things were taken for granted how easy it might be coming into League One where... From, again, from the outside looking in, I don't want to speak speak um, wrongly of what things actually were like, but it seemed like once Sunderland were relegated, they, they expected just to walk the division. You know, we're, we're a massive club. We've been in the Premier League. We'll be out of here in no time. But I think for teams like that, League One will get you. And especially the Football League will, will get you. When you're thinking like that, that's when it seems to be at its worst. I mean, I, I, I'm a Preston North End fan and I also cover Preston North End. When they um, were relegated from the championship, it took four or five years to get out of League One. We referred to when we kind of knew Preston were going to be relegated, the fans were referring it to us as a League One tour, thinking, oh, we'll get relegated, be straight back up. And that's not the case. Um, but once you've come down, sort of done your due diligence, got the right people involved, right manager, the right players, obviously the situation with the owner wasn't, wasn't great. But once you've got those sort of foundations in place, you're now in a position to, to push forward. And a club the size of, of Sunderland with the backing that they've got and the revenue that can generate gives you a great foundation to push from. And, and the players that were already there, you know, it, they're now sort of showing the potential. It's what they're capable of. It's still no mean feat to be top of the league at any point of the season. Um, and, you know, Sunderland have been a top side for a good couple of years, just not quite... Um, followed through on it. But yeah, it's, it's kind of what I'd expect from Sunderland. They are too big a club, probably too good to be at this level, especially recently. Um, but at the end of the day, the best teams will go up. And as good as Sunderland have been without following through, you can't really... No one doesn't deserve to go up. You know, it's one of those things. No one really des doesn't deserve to stay down at the same time, I think. Without you know, doing it for the whole season and, and getting over that finishing line, you know, you, you should be in League One. But this season seems to be the one where everything's sort of aligning, the manager, the, the the infrastructure, all that sort of stuff seems to be coming into one in, into place. And hopefully this could be the season for you, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. I was going to say this, this tour of League One's gone on about three years too long for my liking. So fingers crossed, yeah. mate. Um, I think last season when I asked the same question, which players do you worry about from Sunderland? The answer from December onwards came Aidan McGeady. Occasionally Charlie White, because on paper we're scoring a lot of goals. Mm. Thankfully, there's a lot of players doing very, very well. I talked about it being called Winchester's World before, and it is. Um, Ross Stewart started really well. But again, outside looking in, which players do you feel most concerned about for Fleetwood going into the game on, on Saturday? Well, as I mentioned, I um, obviously I'm a, I'm a Preston fan as well and covered Preston. So Aidan McGeady is always going to be one that stands out for me. He had that season, obviously, under Grayson uh, in the Championship where he, he was brilliant. And, I, you know, I think when given a run of games, given proper game time, he's still very good. Uh, showed that last season. Um, again, having having been, obviously, on the far coast, Elliot Embleton's one that, that stands out. Obviously, Blackpool were bit disappointed not to be able to take him up to the championship after the season he had um, at Blackpool. So I think, you know, that's a pretty good sign <laughs> if a championship club are disappointed not to keep hold of one of your players that you loaned out to him. I know, I know there's a bit of frustration last season from Sunderland that he was even out there in the first place when he could have been doing the, the business he was doing at Blackpool at Sunderland. Um, but yeah, as you say, there's, there's so many different players. You, yeah, again, you mentioned um, Ross Stewart, four goals already it's not you know it's not bad is it you know so I mean for me it probably because of my own personal biases Ada McGeady Elliot Embleton are the ones I'm more looking at see how McGeady's still getting on it's still quite a few years since he left Preston Embleton having been at Blackpool last season and and whether he could do it again at, at Sunderland this season obviously a product of the academy and things there so those are the ones I'd look out for but as you say I think what's different maybe about Sunderland, as I mentioned before, about having the infrastructure, having all the things in place is it, it's kind of a little bit more spread out. There's a, a much, much better oiled machine rather than McGeady to Wyke. And <laughs> if, if that fails, 
I hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, I think a lot of Sunderland fans will hear that and agree. I think the be- the best thing about me asking that question week on week is no one's yet said Dan Neil, who was obviously going to be the next Andreas Iniesta um, on current <laughs> form. So I'm pleased he's flying under the radar because Man City, you can't have him if you're listening. Um, <laughs> final question as always. I've not been too great with them. I think I've got one right so far this season, three last year, but predictions. Um, Fleetwood, I never enjoy going down to ever. And I have a pretty stinking feeling for some bizarre reason about this weekend, but I'm going to ignore that stinking feeling and go with the heart and potentially the head based on current form. And I'm going to say... 2-1 to Sunderland, but, but Tom, you're more rehearsed in the Fleetwood side of things. Where are you going with it? Well, the the thing with Fleetwood and coming to Highbury is it. I think it depends on the mood of the old wind machine. It is kind of the the old joke around the far coast is that because it's on the seaside, the, the weather certainly plays its part. I know, I'm sure in the northeast you're used to all sorts of weather, but, um, you know... The, it's very quite an open pitch. The wind does affect a lot of teams, and I. But I think with the way Fleetwood would have been a little bit getting a bit tougher to beat, they might just be finding that sort of rhythm. I think, given Sunderland's form, Sunderland was kind of Fleetwood might just look to frustrate. Make sure that the first point of call is make yourself hard to beat. You know, if you're not going to win it, don't lose. So I, 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 would, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a nil-nil, sort of a frustrating afternoon for, for Sunderland where, you know, things aren't quite coming off. Fleet would have a chance here and there, but the main thing is the solid and they can keep building this platform to, to sort of push on from. And when you're coming up against top of the league, you know, you're going to take a point, I suppose, aren't you? Simon Grayson's not daft. If you can take a point from those sorts of sides and beat the so-called lesser sides that may be below you in the table, you know, it's going to stand you in decent stead. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, really great to have you on. Um, if, like I said, it felt like it's been a while, but well worth it, mate. Yeah. Um, thanks for the Absolute pleasure. On. Um, no problem. And I wish Fleetwood all the luck, uh, apart from on Saturday and when we play them <laughs> in the return game, of course. But um, of as course, always... Likewise. <laughs> well, as expected, yes, I, I always I always <laughs> expect that back. But um, in regards to everyone listening, thanks again for tuning in. Please feel free to subscribe. We'll be back on Saturday with a, a reaction show. Hopefully, it's been four reaction wins, I think, for your reaction. So four reaction shows, four reaction wins. Hopefully, we can keep it up. If not, we'll still be there. Do subscribe if you want to listen to it. If you don't, don't subscribe. <laughs>